Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here uh, with all of you at um, Startup um, Grind. I think you know you're a great community. It's the best community of of, of kind of builders and innovators, and um, I'm excited to contribute a little bit of knowledge if I can. So I want to talk today about what you all can do to build API startups faster, and specifically like thinking about how you can iterate faster on your products to to, to build better things. Um, my background is I'm head of engineering at Plaid. We're an API company in the fintech space. We power everyone from like Venmo, Robinhood, Lending Club, Acorns, et cetera, all use us. Been there about four years, built a team to about 200 engineers. Uh, before that, I worked at Dropbox where I was for four years and I have a young son who's 16 months old and does not let me sleep as much as I used to. Cool, so um, you can read up on Pied Online. We're great, that's not a recruiting thing, so I'm not gonna go deep on it. Um, I wanna really focus on, on the meat of the content today to help all of you. So I think it's not controversial to say that iteration speed is, is key to success as a startup and any company that's fast growing, right? Obviously, if you're trying to go zero to one, if you can iterate faster, you get more shots on goal at getting to product market fit. But the reality is all of you are gonna build businesses, products that are gonna be competitive throughout your whole life, right? Not just until you get to product market, market fit. And if you're faster than your competitors at iterating, you're, you're much more likely to succeed, right? So in, in the world of what I call UI products, and a UI product would be something like Instagram, it's really easy to iterate because you can force your users in a new experience, right? You can uh, put a big shiny button for someone to like go to a new feature. You can make the feature part of onboarding. You can force the user into the feature when they open the app. You just have a wide range of things that you can do to, to force usage. And then from the usage, you can run A-B tests. You can learn about what is or isn't working. And that, that, that's the, like the heart of fast iteration. The problem with API products, right, uh, is that for your user to experience any new aspect of it, any feature, they need to write code, right? And code takes effort. And so you actually, you don't have any way to force the developers and your customers to use the new features that you built for them. Even if you were to do something crazy, like just break your current API and tell all your customers like, hey, you've got to move to the new version, there's really no guarantee that they would. And, and as a matter of fact, the, the kind of person who will use your new version of an API is not representative of all your customers, right? Because it's someone who's opted in to that feature. And so you're often not even getting feedback about whether that iteration is valuable for the rest of your user base. So what I wanted today is first like dig into a couple of other like rough edges of API products, because I want all of you to think from first principles about how API products are different. Because I think if you internalize that, that's how you're gonna be more successful moving forward. And, and by the way, a lot of you may not be building API products. So you're like, hey, I'm gonna like quit this talk. But the reality, more and more companies are a mix of UI and API products, right? Slack would be a clear example. It's a UI product, right? That's how the majority of users experience it. But the API integrations are a key part of what make it like really successful and sticky, right? And I think for more and more businesses, that's, that's true. Cool, so let's talk about the rough edges. First rough edge, I mentioned that adoption requires work, right? It requires product and engineering work by your customer. And so there are two implications there, and they're really important. The first one is the value that you deliver has to be more than the work that it takes, right? So say you do a cosmetic change to your API to make it like easier to use, right? And then like better error codes or whatever, your existing customers will not give two shits. They just cannot, they, could care, they will not care about that, right? Because for them, there's no value. They learn to use the first version of the API, like they're happy. They don't care about it, you know, nicer API definition. The second implication is that the ROI isn't defined versus like, it's not just whether it would provide more value than them implementing it. You're actually competing with ROI with their entire roadmap, right? If there's something else that they could do that would be higher ROI, they just won't do it. Even if your thing that you're asking them to do is ROI positive. And this is something we found a lot at Plaid. We like launched a feature that we, we knew our customers would love. But the reality is they were like in growth mode or they had some other worry for the company. And so strategically, there was no alignment for them to use the new feature. And it might, it might have taken a year, whereas we expected it to take you know, two, three weeks. Cool. Um, usage depends on your developer customer being successful. So you have a customer, they're like, yeah, I'm going to use the new feature that you built. They spend the engineering time to build on it. But then it takes them another three months to launch the end user feature that relies on your API. So that means your cycle is not just waiting for your customer to decide to spend time on it, which is already longer than most products, but then you have to wait for them to build the end feature that's gonna affect an end user. So often, you know, you, you have to think about ROI in terms of like two companies' iteration cycles. 
And one of them you don't control at all, right? You have no control over your customer's iteration cycles. Three, uh, developers are gonna build around your bugs. This is like this is like the greatest finding for me when I joined Plaid, which is like we would fix what was a bug in our product, like fix a data field or whatnot. And then our customers would be like, yo, you broke us. And we're like, no, no, we we're just fixing a bug. And they would be like, yeah, but we, we'd already had if else statements or we'd already trained our models to account for the bug. So when you fix the bug, you actually broke our models. And if that's a lender, right? If it's a lender that's relying on a bug of your product to make lending decisions and you fix the bug and it breaks the lending model, they're gonna be really unhappy. So the result of that is as a developer, you're kind of walking on eggshells at times because you won't know if something will be interpreted as breaking to your, to your customers. All right, and then the final rough edge is that APIs are forever. Uh, I, it does not matter how much value you deliver via a new API version, there's gonna be some customers that are just not willing to move. And, and generally because they're totally happy with the previous version. So it'll, you, know, you just have to operate in a world where you have to kind of support your entire product, product surface area for long periods of time. And the reason why this hurts velocity is because this introduces a lot of technical debt and technical debt is the enemy of velocity, right? Cool, so these are a lot of problems. Uh, and if you don't do something about these problems, you're gonna become like a very waterfall -y company. And being very waterfall -y is good in some mediums, but it doesn't result in the highest like velocity of iteration. And so it's gonna, not gonna be great, I think, for you in the, in the market. So we gotta be clever about velocity. So what can you do? So solutions. One, first solution, you need design partners. You need customers or potential customers that, are, that have dedicated engineering that's just working with you on iterating on your new product version. And for all of you that are doing new startups, like especially in the B2B space, this is no brainer, right? You should have a design partner definitely to get to product market fit. The difference with an API startup is you need the design partner all the way through your life, life cycle. Like if you stop, you know, really focusing on that after you get to product market fit, you're gonna lose. I think something at Plaid, I wish we'd done more of like through our middle years. I think we're pretty good at it now. I think we're really good at it early, but I think in the middle, we lost sight of the importance of a design partner. You know, companies like Stripe, for example, did it really well with, with Lyft or with Shopify and it's huge. Um, the second tip, and this one I don't see discussed on the interwebs that much, but I think it's really important, is look, your new users, they're your testing ground for new features. A new user, they sign up for your product, and then they look at your getting started guide, and they just go to the getting started guide, like the majority of them. They don't worry about old API versions and whatnot. They assume the latest is the greatest. And so one way that you can iterate quickly is you're really good about launching the feature and updating your getting started guide. And if you can do that, right, you can just get more people to use new things in your product. And that's like really, really powerful. There, there's two caveats, right? Again, the fact that they're implementing to it doesn't mean that they've shipped their end feature. So you still have that problem where it takes a little bit more time to get, you know, to know really what the usage looks like at scale. The second caveat, which is something you definitely should spend time thinking about is new developers may not be representative of your entire customer base, right? Um, and so if you do too much work focusing on your self-serve customers, you may make existing, you may build things that are not really responsive to your existing customers that are already at scale. So I think if you do these two things really well though, like design partners with like your larger established customers that are big enough to be willing to dedicate engineering to work closely with you. And then you have a really good self-serve cycle for new developers, you can, you can get a lot of mileage uh, and, and you, can, you can get a lot of iteration speed. Cool. What about tricks on the technical side? Look, on the technical side, it comes down to being able to do versioning really well. There's a ton of good content online about doing versioning. I'm a big believer in per feature and per customer versions, and I'll explain why in a second, but I'm not gonna go, I'm gonna go into, I'm not gonna go in details about how you, how you can do versioning well. I think the thing that you're trying to manage with, with versioning is internal technical debt, right? You, you, you cannot have your code base with if else statements for every version of your API. That'd just, just be a disaster. So like often, I think the, the, the solution is to build in a few areas in your code base shims, which are basically translation layers where you isolate all the complexity of having five, 10, 15 versions of your product only in the shims. Um, and again, you can look that up online. It's, it's, it's pretty cool concept in CS and, and there's a bunch of companies that give advice about how you can build shims well. Cool, so, so why do you care about versioning? Because all the problems that I mentioned above, they're about the fact that some customers will be affected more negatively than others or will be more or less willing to adopt the change that you've made or adopt a new feature. And so what you really want to do is isolate the impact of change to customers that are going to be okay with it, right? Um, and that's how you iterate quickly. You really like focus on places where there's not going to be complaints. You iterate with those folks to get it good. And then after, after a while, you make a, a big version change that everyone has, say, a year or two years to adopt. Um, 
Yeah, a perfect example would be you have a feature. It's not a breaking change, you don't think, but you're not sure, right? This is the walking on eggshells part. You're not sure. But you know there's some subset of your customers like where you're like 95% sure they're not going to be affected by the non-breaking change. Just ship it to them and see what happens, right? Um, and the other 95% of your users, like just don't get that feature. You don't care about it. Like that's okay. You'll give them more time to adopt it. Cool. And then it all comes, you know, versioning will come down to documentation. So before I talked about documentation in terms of the getting started guide for new developers, for existing developers, the trick around versioning, it's like migration guides. And here's, here's a little bit story for you. If, if you're, you go to a customer and you're like, hey, new feature requires you to spend engineering. This is the value that I get out of it. They're gonna be like, value sounds great. How, how expensive is it gonna be for me to do this? And generally, if they, they are like, okay, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find an engineer in the next couple of months who can spec this out and figure out like how hard it would be to integrate with a new version or whatnot, you've kind of lost the battle. But if you give them a migration guide that helps them understand not in like two months, but in 30 minutes, it lets an engineer look at it in 30 minutes and be like, you know what, this migration isn't gonna be that bad. Like, I don't need to like spec it for a while. Like I see enough from this. They've made the steps easy enough that, you know, I don't, I'm not stressed out about it. If you can do that, then you win, right? Because then you, they, people will stop focusing on the cost aspect because you'll make it at least seem and ideally in reality, it is easy to migrate from one version to the other. Cool. You know, the background for all this is breaking changes and deprecation is very expensive. Sometimes you have to do it. And just the warning is it will take you years. It will erode customer trust and it, it will do those things however much you try to, to, to do it well. Like, you know, you could tell customers, oh, in two years, you're going to have to migrate to the new version. You could remind them every month for that entire period. I guarantee you, like a month before the date, one of your customers, that's like 2% of your revenue is going to say like, hey, I need a three month extension. And, you, you know, you're going to have a talk with your business team and your revenue team and your finance team. And people are going to be like, two to 3% of revenue, like, yeah, of course we have to extend the deadline. So you just, you just have to live with it. And I, I really urge you like manage the complexity of the long lives of APIs versus like trying to create a world where you don't have to manage that complexity and assume the problems will go away. Cool. All right. So conceptually, hopefully like there's some good tips in there. I want to, I want to talk about just the nature of API businesses that I think people don't understand enough. And, and as soon as you get your product market fit, you should switch your mindset to this, which is your APIs are not the product. The APIs are not the product. The APIs are not the product. The product is what your developer customers are building on top of the API. So an example, if you're a company that has a programmatic API to change text messages, and then a subset of your users is using that to do one-time passwords, right? To like verify identity and ownership of a device. You're not competing against other companies that allow you to send text messages. You're competing against other ways to verify identity and, de and device ownership, right? And so like if Apple has like a new way to do those things, your customers may move to it, right? If it's easier and better. And so this is really important. Like the API at first looks like a building block. And so you, your mindset is like, I'm building Legos. But from a product perspective, your mindset needs to be like, what problems are my customers solving with the API? Because that's the competitive dy dynamic of the element that, that, of the world that, that, you're, that you're in. So for Plaid, like, yeah, we allow end users to share their financial history with the fi FinTech apps that they want to use. Sure. But what's done with, with that? Well, lenders issue loans, right? Like neobanks want to fund accounts. Merchants want to pay for, want to help people pay for things. Financial advisors want to give financial advice. PFMs want to help people save for retirement, right? And so if any of those use cases, there's a better way to do the thing than Plaid, then we will lose, right? And I think you can, you can, you can really lose track of that competitive dynamic pretty quickly because you'll think of your competitive space as other companies that are doing the same thing as you, but that's not what's happening. Your competitive space is anybody that could help your end user solve their problem better. Um, and I think this goes back to the design partners, right? Why you're not just trying to understand like, the problem with the API, you're trying to understand their business problem. I think this, by the way, is the most fun thing about building an API company. Like as a platform, you have to understand the entire ecosystem that's built on top of you. Um, cool, we're almost done. It, you know, if this all felt like bad news, the good news is I think a, not a lot of people have been thoughtful about how you can iterate quickly on APIs. So I think if you spend some like mental space on it, you'll probably find a lot of other tricks that are, that are very powerful. But really the good news is that all these ill idiosyncrasies that make it difficult to iterate, make it one hard for your customers to move to somebody else. 
And two, they make it difficult for someone to copy your product. Even if someone just copied the API definition, there's too much happening like implied in that for it to ever be a rip and replace. This is super powerful. You're gonna have amazing cohorts if you're this kind of company. And then finally, I didn't go through it. There's a lot of other tricks you can use. Think about how you design SDKs. You can take multiple calls to your API and wrap them in, in, in cool API wrappers. You can use external shims where you externalize the, some of the technical debt on your customers. A lot of the cool things that, that you can do that can help with iteration speed. Um, anyway, thanks for having me. I'm excited to see what all of you as builders and creators kind of come up with in the coming years. Uh, my name is John Denis. I'll be doing Q&A in like 10 minutes, but you can always reach me on, on Twitter. And I think from my Twitter handle, you should be able to guess my plat.com email address. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty free of my time and I, I, like to, I like to help people out where I can. So. Good luck with all of you and thank you so much for having me on Startup Grind.